So this is from my book. It's out of print, Cleansing Clothes. And I'm doing something perilous. I'm putting, these are very intense issues. These are, these are problematic issues sometimes in the church. And uh, so I'm putting them all together in compressed form. So that's even more uh, wild. So I know you probably can't read this, but if anybody's interested, these four links here um, are to longer, more detailed presentations than the one I'm giving you. I'm giving you the compressed, super compressed, uh, simplified version. So um, the top one is the one I did at Sacramento Central. Uh, so is the second one. Actually, I've done all these at Sacramento Central. Um, the fourth one, there, somebody actually wrote a book against these beliefs, some of the seminary professors, uh, a few years ago. And uh, Pastor Buttery asked me to come to Sacramento Central and uh, tell the corrected side of the story. So I did. That's the third one. The fourth one there, New Books, Old Error. So anyway, if you want those, I'll have that link at, at the end. But let's get into our uh, presentation today. So I recognize this is compressed. And you might say, boy, that's, that's pretty intense things. But we're going to deal with four more of these today. First of all, Christ's character reproduced in us. And it'll help me if I get my own notes out. All righty. So let's talk about justification. Justification is God's way of simultaneously counting men right and making them right. In declaring a man just, God writes no fiction. The disciple experiences the process of sanctification, and the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in us. Both justification and sanctification are the work of God and are necessary and causative for salvation. Okay. When a man comes to Christ and accepts him as personal Savior, he's counted as if he had never sinned. Isn't that true? Accepting means receiving the work of God, permitting his power to work recreation. He makes planets, he makes galaxies, he makes your heart. There are conditions to our receiving justification, sanctification, and the righteousness of Christ. While good works will not save even one soul, it is impossible for even one soul to be saved without a faith that works. Just ask James chapter 2. God transforms us according to a principle. I think you know the principle from Matthew chapter 7. Ask. In order to receive, we have to ask. In order to find, we need to seek and knock. To knock, to have the door open to us, we, we, we knock and then the door opens. So when God justifies a man, declaring him right, he also makes that man right. And let me, let's take a Bible example. And I'm going to invite you to turn over to Luke chapter 18. I think you're familiar with this, Luke chapter 18, but let's look at it uh, nonetheless. Luke 18, starting at verse 9. I want you to pay close attention to the uh, things that the parable says about justification. So we're at Luke 18, starting at verse 9. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So here's the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So there the two of them are, worshiping. The one's up near the front, and he thinks he's Mr. Righteousness. So the one, this guy's just in the back, just in the back door. He's just in the very back, and he says, Lord, be merciful to me. Now listen to the, the very next thing. Here's what Jesus says. I tell you, this man, the, tac, the, the one in the back, this man went down to his house. Well, what happened to him? Justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So his surrender, here's the, the, this fellow in the back. His surrender is accepted where he is. God changes him. Justification imputes or counts a man right. At the same time, justification also imparts righteousness 
rightness to the man, and that's why Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified. He went to church, he came back justified. The human agent simply does what? A thousand jumping jacks? Step, uh, kissing each step as you go up pilot staircase? No, none of those things. The human agent simply surrenders. That's all he does. He surrenders, agreeing, I have made a miserable failure on my own. Please take me where I am and as fast as I can go, the way I need to go. That's, your, that's the prayer. Is that too complicated? It's not. Here's a blade of grass. The new blade of grass is a half inch tall, but it's perfect for a new blade of grass. Another is larger, it has been growing longer, and it's perfect for its degree of maturity. And another blade of grass is full grown, its roots are deep, and it stretches perfect and green in the breeze. And I say to you that each blade of grass is perfect for its stage of development. And I believe that's one of the principles of the way things work. Then we have the thief on the cross, Luke 23. He wasn't converted for very long, was he? But for his stage of Christian growth, that thief on the cross was perfect. He, we will be praying. We will be studying the inspired writings. We will be in attendance at the meetings of the church. We will pursue pursuing our devotional life. We will walk into the light of truth as fast as light opens up. Entire conformity to the will of our Heavenly Father is what we want. As he unfolds, unfolds things to us, entire conformity to his will, that's what sanctification is. The universe is watching and waiting for our sanctification. Romans 8 talks a lot about that. The soul creation groans until the, the full birth of the sons and daughters of God. Justification and sanctification are part of one gospel. God can be just and justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, but no person can cover himself with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. Our heart must be surrendered entirely before justification can take place. And for the continued experience of justification, we keep walking with Jesus. Faith works purifying the soul. That's what Galatians 5, 6 says. God's word declares in Daniel 12, verse 10, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Yes, that's what the Bible says. To say that something is caused of salvation for salvation means that without it, salvation isn't caused. Now, it may be fashionable today to say that we're saved by justification alone, but sanctification, being made holy, is necessary. Without holiness, Hebrews 12, 14 says, without holiness, we cannot see God and meet him in peace. That's strange. I don't hear that verse repeated too often by most people, but... The Bible gives us that verse. Matthew 5, verse 8 says, says we need that pure hearts are the ones that are going to see God. Jesus said that. Titus 3, verse 5 says we need an inward washing. Revelation 14 says that guileless hearts experience the end time crisis, crises remaining blameless before God's throne. Think we're nearer to the end time crisis than we have been before? Well, yes, we are. Disobedience can be forgiven. Pardon is a gift, but obedience, holiness, being like Jesus, that is developed. We will not finally be asked, what did you believe? But the judgment will be centered on what did you do? Read Matthew 25. That's what the question is. What we have done will testify to what we have become. So be ready for that judgment. You know what? The devil could give a perfect rendition of the beliefs, couldn't he? God could ask him, do you know, what do you, what is, is this a true statement about the Sabbath? Is this a true statement about the second coming? Is this a true statement about baptism? The devil could answer all those questions more better than you or I or any seminary professor. But it's not going to be about what the devil knows is true or believes to be true. It's going to be about what did we do for Jesus? What did we do for our fellow man? Salvation means change, actual change. And actual change means learning to echo Jesus even while our, our own disordered humanity and defective characters war in us in rebellion against goodness. You know what it says in 1 John 2 verses 5 and 6? 
Whoso keepeth his word in him verily, verity is the love of God perfected, whereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Who is the he? The he is Jesus. We want to give ourselves to him, but we're weak in moral power. Controlling our thoughts, impulses, and affections, it seems like an impossible goal sometimes. Our broken promises lead us to doubt our own sincerity. Is there really any hope for me? Sometimes we would ask ourselves. You know, when we have sinned, we need to repent again and lay hold on Christ with renewed determination. In the Gospels, how many people did Jesus turn away? Give me a list. I can't think of one person in the Gospels that Jesus turned away. Can you? Not one who sought him was left to perish. We need to understand what the Holy Spirit seeks to accomplish through our will. Yes, I said our will. Jesus desires that we stop sinning. But when we do fail, we're reminded that 1 John 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Our high priest is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows by experience the battle fought in our kind of flesh, Hebrews 2, verse 18. And we're going to talk about the nature of Christ in a couple minutes. So we're at, when we're at the verge of failing, we have to pray, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I'm sure you've read that somewhere. Mark 9 will get you there. When despair seizes us, we must learn to trust, to depend solely upon the merits of the atonement, and in all of our helpless unworthiness, cast ourselves upon the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. Not one of us will be saved apart from Jesus. It is his merits and his merits alone that bring salvation to us. Let us make each occasion of failure the first step in climbing the Mount of Blessing again. You know, when we look back someday, what looked like a string of failures is going to be seen to be a succession of victories. I remember when I was in grade school, we had the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. I don't know if they still give that. But I remember I had a problem with one of the things. There was a, a long jump, standing long jump. And for some reason, I just had a lot of trouble. I worked, I jumped and jumped and jumped. And I wanted, the, I had everything else. I could do all the other pieces. I wanted the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. And finally, the day came that I jumped far enough. And the, the gym teacher, the PE teacher said, yep, you got it. And I got my Presidential Physical Fitness Award. Now, I earned that. So this isn't a very good illustration because all the salvation we get is earned by Jesus. Okay, so don't, don't, don't bend this the wrong way. But at the same time, we want to be in the kingdom. We want to just keep coming to him, keep surrendering. And you know what? If you want the Presidential Physical Fitness Award for surrender, when you fail, then just keep turning back and turn back to Jesus. And you'll be forgiven. God will change you. He will change your heart. Don't lose hope. So when we're on the verge of failing, pray, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And we can climb the Mount of Blessing again. We can be like that prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 who it says at one point he came to himself. And sometimes we take a while to come to ourselves. We need to come to ourselves. So that means that basically God's Holy Spirit has been working to get us be able to come to ourself and let us approach the throne of grace. Hebrews 4 tells us about Jesus and that throne of grace. So now a question, a question that's asked in Romans chapter 3. Can God be just and count a man who's not right, right? Can he do that? He can't do it. His great desire is to heal people, to grant them rightness inwardly. Imparted righteousness and sanctification, it's, it's really the same thing. Being made holy is, is part of salvation. Some people want to put the holy part outside. You're, you're saved entirely by justification, and sanctification is just a nice accessory. But the Bible does not cut it that way. We need both pieces. And you know, how can you, if, if you're going to give your kid a coin, he's going to get the coin with the front side and the back side of the coin, Right? And when God gives us justification, the other side of that coin is sanctification. He, you can't get half. You can only get all or nothing. And with Jesus, what does he want to give you? All or nothing. He wants to give you all. Imparted righteousness and sanctification is really the same thing. Being made holy is part of salvation. The gospel does these things in us which are both necessary and causative for salvation 
as much as Christ sacrificed for us on the cross. All merit for our salvation comes from Christ, whether it's imputed or imparted. In the last generation, it is demonstrated what God can do. He can transform us, or he can't. And the world will know, the universe will know from our lives which one is true. Can he or can't he? You are the evidence. You say, well, I don't think he's demonstrated that yet. I don't think he has. We are still here. But we know what's coming. So let's go on to the next section here of these four sections. Obedience is a, con a condition of salvation. Here's what we say. Obedience is both a condition and an ongoing requirement of salvation. Now, some of these you need to maybe hold your horses before you, you can... Let me give the whole explanation, and then you, you can be unhappy if you're unhappy. But I think you'll be happy. Obedience is both a condition and an ongoing requirement of salvation. Many have been subtly taught that we're saved apart from obedience, and that obedience is only a fruitage after you've been saved. Many people have been taught that. People want the benefits that God offers, but without the conditions. Conditions that will help heal our sin problem. Now, when Jesus met the withered man at the pool of Bethesda, what did he say to him? Rise. This is, this is John 5, if you want it, John 5, 8. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, this man might have argued with Jesus. He might have said, well, if I were to do that, that would be legalistic. But he believed Christ's word. He believed that he was made whole. He made the effort immediately. He willed to walk, and he did walk. He acted on the word of Christ, and God gave the power. He was made whole. Faith is more than mental ascent. It's more than just thinking it's true. Faith includes trust and willingness to obey the person one trusts. The devil knows these things are true, but he's not willing to trust God. He wants to do it his own way. So in the Bible, believing, trusting, and obeying, they're all the same thing. But now this raises a question. Which comes first, obeying or believing? Now, that's kind of a problem, isn't it? Which one comes first? Let me tell you why it's a problem. Acts 5.32 says the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. So I guess we have to have the Holy Spirit first, right? But John 15 says without Jesus, you can't do anything, right? So we've got a problem going on there, see? I have to have the Holy Spirit to obey, but I cannot obey without Jesus. Without Jesus, I cannot have the Holy Spirit. Circular problem. So let's consider a couple possibilities. What if, what if the solution is this? God grants the gift of salvation first, and obedience only comes afterward as the fruit of being saved. What if that's the case? Now, obedience is a fruit of salvation. That's true. Obedience is a fruit of salvation. But I say to you that it is not only a fruit. Obedience is part of the faith that says yes to the gospel. Obedience is present inescapably at the beginning of the Christian experience. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, we must obey the gospel. And yet Galatians 5 6, we have to have a faith that works. We need both pieces. Jesus called the rich young ruler. What did he tell the rich young ruler? He said, okay, I'll tell you what. Go, sell everything you have, give the proceeds to the poor, and he said, then you come and follow me. Matthew 19 for that story. He saw the man was committed more to his own values than to the kingdom. And you know what? This rich young ruler could not serve two masters. He has to obey at the first moment of discipleship, even as at each following step, or he wouldn't be a disciple of Christ. So obedience is not only something that follows. Obedience is present in your first turning to Jesus. If you join this church through an evangelistic meeting and the, plea, the appeal came from the, from the preacher to give your heart to Jesus and you may not be, you're not baptized yet, but when you chose to accept Jesus, that was a step of obedience. Was that somehow not a step of obedience? No, that was a step of obedience. So I say at the beginning and at each step of the way we need to obey. But what if we say, this, here's another option here. Let's say we don't like that. 
that obedience is, is uh, we are saved and then obedience is only a fruit. What if we say instead that we have to obey in our own power first and that only after that we qualify for salvation? You know, we meet the condition and then we're saved. What if at first we must obey and then after that we've obeyed we receive the Holy Spirit? You know what? That would be a legal religion. You'd be saved by doing the legal thing. And then in some measure, one would initially obey without Jesus, right? And so then by independent obedience, somebody has in some measure earned salvation. Well, we know that's not right. So neither one of these is, is correct. You're saved, but obedience is something separate? No, that's not correct. You obey without the Holy Spirit? How do you do that? Can't do that. I'm going to suggest to you a third possibility. A third possibility, in the very same moment that we sincerely repent and ask for strength to obey, God sends us power to obey. In the very same moment. Now, but you say, well, wait a minute, doesn't God have to, isn't there like a, a 40 millisecond delay? Well, there might be a 40 millisecond delay by, by technology. A radio wave maybe takes some period, some little tiny period of time between the signal and then getting to the other end, right? Is God constrained by those issues? Does God have to wait? And then is there like a little second where God's, God's brain goes, oh, he's, all, he's in my team now. Yes, I'll give him strength. There is not. So the third possibility is that in the very same moment we repent and ask for strength to obey, God gives us power to obey. At the same time we respond in faith, God speaks and gives us power to be obedient. Power is given to act in obedience. In our very first plea for help, God grants help. God and man speak at the same time. We call it, in singing, we call it singing in, in what? Harmony. At the same, you're, it, it, you're matching at the same time. Obeying is neither first nor last. All of God's biddings are enablings. We're not asked to do righteousness apart from his gift of righteousness. In the very moment that God calls for our, our obedience, he enables us. In that same moment, righteousness is imputed and it is imparted. Because God doesn't have to wait 40 milliseconds to give you the help. He doesn't save us by law, neither will he save us in disobedience to law. Neither faith nor obedience saves. Neither does salvation come without the obedience of faith. Without the faith that obeys, authentic Christianity is impossible. So now there's a difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. Okay, a necessary condition has to be met to get the desired effect. There, has, there may be ne several necessary conditions. So like if you're operating a, a gasoline-powered automobile, right? What do you need? What are the necessary conditions to make it work? Well, you need to have gasoline, you need to have coolant, you need brake fluid in there, that's a pretty important piece. You need a battery with an electrical charge and you need to trigger the ignition probably with your key or maybe a push button these days. To start the vehicle and to continue its operation, several things are necessary. These are necessary conditions. So that's necessary conditions. Now there are also sufficient conditions. A sufficient condition is this way. It automatically leads to the desired effect. In itself, it accomplishes everything that's needed. It is sufficient. So I must be obedient to be saved, but my obedience in itself is not a sufficient condition. It's not sufficient to save me. How am I saved? We all know the answer, don't we? Jesus died on the cross. He made a sacrifice of sufficient value to save me, but I must actively embrace it. If you reject Jesus, will you be saved? Tell me the answer. So there is a part, our part, that we need to agree, surrender, cooperate. But do we get any credit for saying yes to him? What's the answer? You know the answer is no. We don't get any credit for saying yes to him. All the credit is from Jesus. The question of salvation is not really just about the sufficiency of the sacrifice. We know that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient, but it's also about my willingness to embrace it. 
God designed the plan of salvation with two parts. Jesus lived and died in our place. That's the objective part. It's outside of us. But there is a subjective element within us. We must choose to accept all that is meant by his life and death. Jesus' merit is valuable enough to save, absolutely. And yet my obedience is also necessary. It's not sufficient to save me. In fact, it won't even get me 1% of the way there. It is a non-meritorious condition. It is a necessary but insufficient condition. God makes choices and I make choices. The role of human free will is as important in the end of time as it was in the Garden of Eden. And we know that things went troublesome in the Garden of Eden. Christ's life is of sufficient value on the one hand, to prove God's fairness in his dealing with sinners. On the other hand, Jesus shows the universe the final outcome of rebellion. What is the final outcome of rebellion? The Bible says that there is a problem. We call it the wages of sin. All those who make him their Lord and Redeemer will be saved from the God-forsakenness that Jesus experienced. If you take human choice out of the gospel, all that's left is a divine edict. All that's left is an enforcement of the divine will. And so then grace becomes irresistible, but if grace is irresistible, there's no free will. And so our Father's work to save us is not done in isolation from us. By the way, there's another group uh, that believes in irresistible grace. You know, there's Christians that believe in that. And they also have double predestination. The belief that some, from the very beginning, you were destined to be lost. And another group from the very beginning was destined to be saved. You have no choice in the matter. And that's what goes with irresistible grace, is there's no human free will involved. We don't believe that. We believe that the God gave us the human will. It is ours to exercise. Okay, so to summarize this part, I can never bring any of my own works to him as being meritorious. Not one. He must die in my place and live in my life. Because he refuses to override free choice, I must choose his kingdom because I have no power to choose, I must have his help even to choose him. And so, our obedience is a non-meritorious condition for salvation at the beginning and all along the way. We learn to walk with Jesus, following him wherever he goes. God and man speak together in the same moment. It's kind of like singing together with God. Let's go to number seven out of the eight. These last two are shorter. For the first century of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we didn't have questions on these topics. I can give you the books, the historians that have tracked this down in great detail. Uh, we didn't publish different than this. This is, uh, here's one book. J.R. Zurcher uh, wrote this book. And, uh, and then another one's by Ralph Larson. Uh, these, this was published by Review and Herald. Anyway, here's what we're going to say about this. During his earthly sojourn, Jesus, God from eternity and still God, what did he do? He laid aside out of his possession certain of his powers of deity, and he lived as a man in fallen flesh among men in fallen flesh. That's what Jesus did. He did not come to give the obedience of a lesser God to a greater, but as a man to obey God's holy law. He could have recovered those powers at any time. They were his after all. But for our sake, he chose to live as we do. The very center of Christianity is Jesus Christ, isn't it? We believe in him for salvation. Acts chapter 4 says, No other name is given under heaven by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. That's the only one. At the center of Christ's work for man is the incarnation. Jesus steps down from his throne in heaven to take a human body and to be born into this world as an infant and to grow to adulthood, to live a life unsullied by sin, and to voluntarily sacrifice that life for us in our place at the cross. That's the incarnation. The Bible tells us that Jesus was in the beginning with God the Father, John chapter 1. He was God from eternity. He never stopped being God. But he took our flesh. Jesus voluntarily stepped into his creation. He emptied himself of certain of his divine powers in order to pitch his tent side by side with our tents in conditions like our own. That's what it says in John 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, it says in the Greek, and he basically, he skenate, he pitched his tent side by side with your tent. That's what he did. 
He came to this earth this way, not to render the obedience of a lesser God to a greater God, but as a man to obey God's law. He was God, but he gave the obedience of a man to God's law. The Bible commands us to have the mind of Christ. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. We're all familiar with this, I know. But let's look again and see what the Holy Spirit led uh, Paul to put in the Bible for us. Philippians chapter 2, verses, uh, we're only just looking at 5 to 8. Philippians 2, King James Version, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. By the way, a lot of people, if they think about that first verse, they're going to hate that first, that first line, won't they? How could the mind of Jesus be in me? How could the attitude, the spirit, the how could that? Jesus is infinite and pure and way above, and I'm down here in the dirt. But Paul says, I didn't write it. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And the King James Version actually says it that way. Literally, it's the word kenosis in Greek. It means literally he emptied himself. And they thought they there was people that didn't like that idea, so they, they kind of smoothed out the text a little bit there, and they said, well, he made himself of no reputation, but literally he emptied himself. He took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so what you have is Jesus... Jesus emptying himself, some of his powers of deity. He was still God, but he died on the cross for us. We are to live our life surrendered to the Father just like Jesus did. If he used his powers of deity to get him into shortcuts, special shortcuts for obeying that we cannot have, then he would not have shown us how to obey. Jesus is our substitute, but here's the part that a lot of Protestants are missing. Jesus is also our example and if he didn't come in a humanity like ours then the fact would be that he did not show us an example of how to obey he didn't do it I believe he did it and I believe Paul believes he did it so he emptied himself laying aside powers that we cannot have to obey by faith just like we must obey now it would have been an almost infinite humiliation for Jesus to take man's nature even before Adam sinned in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity with when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like all of us, he experienced the results of heredity. With such heredity, he came to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. Well, that's pretty strong wording. And I borrowed that from a book you have on your shelf called The Desire of Ages. He trusted in the Father just as it is our privilege. He exercised faith. When Satan came to tempt him, he found no foothold. John 14, 30, there was nothing in Jesus that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin. Now listen, not even by a thought did he yield to temptation, and that's the way it can be with us. Psalm 17, verse 3, Revelation 3, 21, and, and there's more. Jesus lived as a man just as we must live as men. His humanity was united with divinity. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Remember that we may be partakers of the divine nature. He lived without sinning by the same indwelling of the Holy Spirit we can experience. The disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee in the boat. Do you remember that? Jesus was with them. A sharp storm arose, threatening to sink the vessel. But Jesus stood up in the boat and he prayed to his father. What happened next? The sea was stilled. And you know, when Jesus was, woke, was awakened to meet the storm, he had been in perfect peace, but he did not then possess almighty power. He had laid that power down. Still God, but he didn't have the almighty power at that time. He could have recovered his powers of deity at any time because they were his by right. But between the time of his entry into the human experience as a babe and the time of his crucifixion, he refused to employ powers that he laid aside. Why? Because we do not have such powers. He was subject to the same constraints in his flesh as we are in ours, for that flesh was, after all, the same kind as ours. 
We can live in fallen flesh without joining ourselves to the deep and dangerous tendencies of that flesh. And we can obey just exactly as he obeyed. You can lay your powers down. Let me tell you, when the president, when the president has to use the restroom, you know, he has the nuclear codes, right? He's still the president, but I don't think they go with him into the restroom. I think that the, the guy with the codes waits right next door, and he's still the president. Those are still his by authority, but he doesn't have them in that very moment. Jesus is within his rights to lay his powers aside and trust them to the Father. He could have got him back whenever he wanted, but he did not. So between the time of his entry into the human experience as a babe and the time of his crucifixion, what did Jesus do? He refused to employ these powers that were his. He was subject to the same constraints in his flesh as we are in ours because that flesh was, after all, the same kind as ours. If you read Hebrews chapter 2, we can live in fallen flesh without joining ourselves to the deep and dangerous tendencies of that flesh. We can obey just exactly as Jesus obeyed. And I want to go to the last section, which is, I think, the shortest Jesus tempted from without and from within. Now, here's definitions are very important here, because if we're not careful, we'll definitely go wrong on this one. So let me say what I want to say. That which Jesus has not assumed, he has not healed. He took our disordered humanity, and he was tempted both from without and from within. I'll explain that. He grants us today an experience of present and complete victory over sin. In the 4th century, this guy, Gregory of Nazianzus, he wrote, the, he wrote something that was really quite profound. The occasion was this called, it's theologically, it's called the Apollinarian Controversy. Pastor Apollinarius taught that Jesus had a human body, but a divine mind. So this wasn't unlike saying that Jesus was like us from the neck down, but he was not like me from the neck up. Gregory said this in, in response, that which he, Jesus, that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. But that which is united with his Godhead is also saved. If only half Adam fell, then that which Christ assumes and saves may be half also. But if the whole of his nature fell, it must be united to the whole of the nature of him that was begotten and so be saved as a whole, unquote. So he said that if, if, if half of Adam fell, then we need a half Adam savior. Did half of Adam fall? When I read Genesis, I believe that all of Adam fell, don't you? And so Jesus came to be a, a ladder, a complete ladder to us. He's the ladder that comes down from heaven, from, from the highest place in heaven. The ladder comes all the way down to where you and I are all the way down so that you can get on at that very bottom step. What if the ladder came and it just reached as high as that fan up there? We'd be in a world of hurt, wouldn't we? Because not a one of us can jump that high. Even Shamus, I don't think, can jump that high. And so the ladder has to come all the way down. The humanity of Christ is often presented as being partly like Adam's and partly like ours. But since the fall affected man in every aspect, we must have Jesus, a Savior, who defeats sin in the same flesh as our own. Matthew 8, 17, remember it talked about Jesus took their iniquities so they could be healed? The humanity that he takes must be entirely affected by the fall, even as ours is, and the victory he wins over that disordered humanity must be just as complete. So we're talking about a complete victory. Jesus won a complete victory. So Jesus took our disordered humanity, not the nature of Adam before his fall, but after. While Jesus was sinless, Hebrews 7.26, very clear, Jesus was sinless. And he never chose to sin. Hebrews 4.15 helps us with that. Did Jesus ever choose to sin? No, no, a thousand times no. While those things are true, his humanity was the same disordered variety as our own. Jesus had come to defeat sin in its own lair before and so, therefore, he must meet sin in fallen human flesh. And that's where we come to our uh, scripture reading that we had in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. Do you remember what it said? For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, 
God sending his own son in the likeness, not the unlikeness, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin. And where did he condemn sin at? In the flesh. Well, in what flesh was that? He condemned sin in the flesh that we have. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? Here it is. In us. So that the righteousness of the law can be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And if you walk after the spirit, God has his victory and he has it in you through the power of Jesus, not through our own power. And so Jesus helps us. What the law couldn't do, Jesus does for us. We can't be saved by the law. If his stripes are going to heal us, he must receive his stripes in our kind of flesh. Isaiah 53, that famous passage, Isaiah 53. Look at that again. Jesus was a free agent. He was placed on probation at risk of failure, just like Adam was and like we are. We resist temptation by faith, laying firm hold upon divine power. With every succeeding generation, the race has been further weakened. You know, Jesus overcame anyway. But each child is weaker than the previous generation. I think that's the case. Revelation 3.21 says that all who overcome will sit in his throne with him. There are significant differences between Christ and us. Don't misunderstand. So one of the charges people make is, oh, you're making Jesus just exactly like us. No, no absolutely not. Let me just give a couple of, you know all these. Significant differences. He was God, we are not. I'd call that a significant difference, wouldn't you? As God, he had inherent rights to power as God. We do not. The value of his character is the character of the righteous God. Ours is not. We've all chosen to sin. He did not. Some of the differences between us and Jesus. Jesus, to successfully redeem man, he must never sin. Now check this out. Jesus could not sin one time without losing everything, right? One sin on his part, and the whole great controversy war would be lost. Jesus lived, while human as we are, in a flesh like our own, with the clamors and the poles of fallenness kept under as he walked those 33 years. Now, you might say, the Pastor, that point is a hard one. I have trouble with that. Well, let's think about it for just a minute. In John they asked, they said, said that Jesus did not need anybody to tell him what was in man because he knew what was in man. That's an interesting piece to think about. Here's another one. Do you remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Luke 22, 42, if you want one of the verses, Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is in the garden. He's praying. It's, it's kind of at the end. It's the ultimate space. And what does Jesus say? Father, Father, Please take this away from me. So what's the will of Jesus? Stop this suffering, please. But that wasn't the whole story. Nevertheless, he said, not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus' will and the Father's will weren't in exactly the same place. And yet, Jesus surrendered to the Father's will. And the Father did not take away. The Gethsemane experience. He did not take away the cross. And so Jesus went all the way to the cross and died on the cross for us. But for a moment there, Jesus' will and the Father's will weren't quite the same. Was that because Jesus was a wimp? Was that because Jesus was really kind of a selfish person deep down inside? Of course not. But his humanity, his humanity was his, his human machinery, his was, was fighting against him. But he resisted, and he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he surrendered himself to the Father, just exactly like you and I must. You think when they drove the nails through his hands and through his feet, you think his body just didn't send, there were no signals that came up his nervous system to his brain, to the pain center? Do you think there was none of that? Of course there was. But Jesus stood faithful anyway. So, one sin on his part and it would have been over. Our case is different. We've sinned many times. There's not one person in this room that can count and say, well, 
I've been keeping count and I've only sinned 9,802 times. And he forgave all 9,802. You probably have a lot more than that on your roster. Jesus, one time. Billions die, it's all over. You and I? God is patient and merciful. If we, through his power, forsake sin, we will be saved at last. If Jesus' life is to have meaning as an example for us, it is crucial that he inherit just exactly what we inherit. If our Lord took a perfect human nature, then he, reconciled, then he reconnected God in man's unfallen nature, but not God in fallen man. And that means that the ladder never came down. It's still, still dangling up there, and we can't quite reach it. But if Jesus took a humanity like we have, then if he shared our fallen human nature, then he has bridged the entire gulf between God and fallen man. And then I say to you, brothers and sisters, then it's true that we have a Savior. Jesus lived his whole life like we will live when probation for men will have closed. We don't talk very much about the close of probation anymore. They don't write books about it. They don't preach about it. Very little do we hear about the close of probation. You've just about got to get your great controversy out to read about that. Or go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. You'll read about it there as well. Jesus lived his whole life like we will live in probation for man will have closed. When redemption is finished and Jesus is ready to return, the sanctuary in heaven will have ceased to operate as it always has before. Something's going to be different. Mediation for sin will have ceased. Willing believers will have stopped sinning. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. No new sins will ascend to be recorded in the sanctuary. Now, after probation closes, some people have made this charge. I've heard it time after time. Oh, there's pe these people are teaching this strange teaching that um, in the, when probation closes, that somehow we are standing alone before God and there's no help for us. I have never met one person who teaches that. Have you? Listen, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Do you remember what it says there? Christ pledged that, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Bible also says that where two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. He promises he will never leave us nor forsake us. Isn't that true? Our characters, we are going to live in the sight. We will live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, but what does that mean? Our characters will have been purified by the blood of Christ, Hebrews 9, verse 14. Through the grace of God and a measure of strong effort on our part called faith, not meritorious, we will have become conquerors in the battle with evil. Jesus not only lived victoriously by the power of the Father, just as we will, but he, like us, was tempted from outside and from the inside. And we talked about the garden experience. But he never chose to join himself to the inclinations of his human machinery. He never developed the habit patterns of sin. Why? Because he never sinned. The humanity that he took clamored and pulled just as ours does. But he never chose to join himself to those inclinations of his human machinery. That's why in the garden he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. That was a moment. The devil wanted Jesus at that moment to say, you know what, God? You know, God the Father, I'm going to go with my feelings. And I don't feel like going through with this now, so time out. Jesus didn't take a time out. And we were all saved because of it. We can be saved because of it. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It gives us courage to face our own battles when we realize that Jesus fought the battle between, against inward inclination, and he kept his character pure. In proving that a human being encumbered, this is the conclusion, in proving that a human being encumbered with all the liabilities of human nature could, by the power of the indwelling Spirit of God, obey, obey his laws, freely and without coercion. When Jesus did that, Jesus showed that God's moral requirements are fair and that Satan has been lying Jesus showed what he is willing to do for the last generation. For 6,000 years, people have wondered, will we be part of that last generation? 
and now it's 2021. I wonder if we could be that last generation. There's the links if you want them for the more detailed. This was just kind of a fast airplane ride, so I didn't prove it. I just told you about it. <laughs>